Hi, everybody. Welcome to the first installment of our series of pre-conference video conversations, mm and Transform Talks. Uh, the intent here is to start the conversation on the future of healthcare marketing ahead of the virtual mm and Transform Conference, uh, which is slated to take place September 30th and October 1st. I'm Mark Eastwitz, Executive Editor at mm and and I'll be your host for this 25-minute conversation. Uh, and joining me for this conversation is my special guest, Dr. Neville Sanjana, who is core faculty member, New York Genome Center, and assistant professor of biology at New York University and of neuroscience and physiology at the NYU School of Medicine. Hi, Dr. Sanjana. It's a pleasure to talk with you again. Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Of course, of course. Uh, I think uh, the last time uh, we spoke was back in May, uh, and we talked about CRISPR uh, and its uh, impact on diagnostics. Today, we're going to talk about something completely different, uh, but perhaps uh, where you're drawing on a similar skill set. Uh, and that's uh, your lab's work on coronavirus mutations, uh, a topic of increasing concern these days, but with case counts due to the pandemic taking an unsettling turn. Um, you posted on Twitter uh, back in June uh, in your lab, the San Jano lab, as recently as this month, updated the findings on the function of the SARS-CoV-2 spike mutation, otherwise known as D614G on a preprint server. Um, you know, why is this why is this concerning? Tell me about this. Yeah. So uh, thanks again for having me here. Um, yeah. So I mean, our lab, like most labs, uh, in March um, we shut down and we um, started working from home. And then a couple of weeks into the, the pandemic, we started to think, you know, we're molecular biologists, we're geneticists, how can we contribute to some um, of the response? The world definitely needed help with dealing with um, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. And one thing that we noticed that we thought was very interesting when we were just uh, sitting at home is we were looking at different mutations um, that were occurring in the virus from different uh, patients that had been sequenced where their uh, nasal swabs had actually been sequenced. And what we observed is there was a mutation that came out uh, in early February that started to sweep through the population. It started to grow in prevalence. And here, sitting here in July, we now know that that mutation is now almost 98, 99% of all coronavirus worldwide. But it started in February as a very small proportion, but we could already see a very um, sharp increase. Um, other data that we had seen around the same time showed that and this was in maybe early April, showed that uh, countries that had more of this mutation tended to have a higher fatality rate. The case fatality rate was higher in those countries where there was more of that uh, D614G mutation in the spike protein. And I, I should just mention the spike protein is really what gives coronavirus its name. It's, it is the outer covering, the little spikes you see on those, those, um, the, the viruses. Um, so for, for these reasons, we thought, hey, maybe this mutation that's growing in prevalence is actually more severe, killing more patients. Um, this really merits some further study. Um, around the same time, a few other groups had started to look at the viral load in patients. And two different groups, one in Washington and one in the UK, had found that patients that have this mutation in their coronavirus uh, samples tended to have a higher viral load. Um, you might have heard of this qPCR-based test that's actually used to test for uh, uh, coronavirus, whether you have coronavirus. This is the gold standard test. And um, what was really interesting is over a couple hundred patients, both of these groups had shown, whether the patients were coming from the United States or the UK, that if you had this mutation, the virus was detected with a much higher, vi the viral load was higher in those folks, uh, meaning it, it was detected sooner in that qPCR-based assay. And so for all these reasons, we, we started to wonder, well, is the virus more uh, deadly? Is the virus more infectious? Again, that higher viral load. Um, and is this something that we could really dissect in, in the lab? And so that's what got us interested and motivated uh, a few of the folks in my lab to really get back into the lab and really test the two forms of the spike protein, the original form, uh, the first sequenced form that had come out of uh, China, and the one that had uh, uh, mutated in, in February to have the spike mutation, to test them head to head in the lab. Sure, sure. So we'll talk about whether the uh, mutation is leading to not only an increase in infectivity, but also an increase in, in mortality in a second. I just wanted to just kind of say, have you say a word about pandemic science. You know, uh, you, you put this uh, paper out on 
a preprint server called BioRxiv, which I assume is a sister server to MedRxiv, which I've seen some other uh, mentions of in the media uh, for other kind of coronavirus-related science. But uh, and this was picked up, you know, by some major media outlets like the BBC, for instance, where I caught your interview um, not long ago. Um, talk, talk about that for a second. How um, the urgency of the pandemic has changed the way science is being done. Yeah, I, I think over the last several years, you know, pre-pandemic, there's been an emphasis on trying to share science faster. And a lot of folks have realized that journals, um, though they provide some great things like peer review, uh, you know, the science gets out in kind of a slower, slower process. Of course, when you're dealing with a pandemic, um, there, there really isn't uh, so much time. You don't have the luxury of waiting. You know, sometimes a paper can take a year or more than a year under review. And yes, peer review is very, very important, but for, for things like uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, it's been very important to get data out there, to, to get tests, diagnostics, information about the virus out to the widest group of scientists um, who themselves can act as peer reviewers for sure. It still is important to have that peer review, but to communicate it as fast as possible. And one thing that's been really great about these preprint servers like uh, BioArchive and MedArchive is that they, um, allow you to upload a paper and it, it to be publicly available, you know, within 24 hours, something like that. Um, and I think that's been really important for, for speeding uh, science along. Um, certainly one thing that's been really helpful for the work that we've done, the spike mutation, you know, we weren't, um, when we initially saw these results, which we found with uh, in the lab, but we saw that the mutation actually increases the um, virus's ability to infect many different human cell types, like lung, liver, colon, um, you know, we actually were unsure about whether, you know, is this a real effect? And we started really testing many other, many other things, but something that gave us a lot of um, confidence in the first uh, days and weeks after our, our paper came out was that not just us, but several other groups, all within the span of maybe a week or two, had papers out on BioArchive. And in, in this sense, it wasn't really a competitive situation, but something more that gave us a lot of um, confidence that what we were seeing was a real effect because other people who we didn't know halfway across the world also replicated the same, the same science and let us really push forward and say, okay, now that we know that this is more infectious, you know, what might be the reasons? How do we counter it? What are the effects on vaccines? All the kind of natural next questions, but um, it accelerated that process basically. Right, so seeing other uh, labs around the world kind of uh, address the same hypothesis and, and be curious about the same things is a way that kind of um, uh, piques your interest, I'm sure, and is something that's good to know. And that whole process is, is be, be, being accelerated. Uh, the other thing that I thought was really interesting was the way your lab, uh, which, you know, your, your lab is comprised of microbiologists and gen genome engineers. You work a lot with CRISPR, which, as I mentioned, we talked about before, uh, but you really altered course uh, to kind of press uh, your people, if you will, into service uh, to, to do pandemic research, which I think is very cool. So but we'll, we'll talk more about that. I wanted to, you know, address the, the, the point about the infectivity and, and the relationship to mortality. Uh, so, you know, all viruses mutate. Obviously, this is a little bit worrisome given the infectivity rate. Um, I mentioned that you posted it on Twitter back in June, and then you updated in July. What did you notice in that interim time that you felt the need to update the, the paper uh, in July? Yeah, I think that's another great thing about these preprint servers is there isn't any sense of a final copy of the of the paper, which is often what you have with, with journals. Here, you're, you're able to update the science as you get new results. And so some work that didn't make it into the first version of the paper, but we were able to add about a month later, um, was one of the hypotheses that we had was that maybe this mutation, the, the change that it induces in the spike protein, you know, we already knew that it makes coronavirus more infectious. But one question we had was, was how? And in the first version of the paper, we kind of explored one dimension of that. But I think one of the most um, straightforward explanations that, that you might have is that we know that the spike protein binds a receptor on human cells called ACE2. And so one thing we wondered is, okay, does this mutation, maybe it just makes spike better at binding the ACE2 receptor. Um, and so uh, with some collaborators uh, here at NYU, we were able to very explicitly test that. We actually purified ACE2 protein and purified either the uh, regular spike or the spike with the mutation. And we looked at that interaction of uh, the ACE2 receptor and the two different forms of spike 
And what we found was actually there's no difference in the binding. So that said that, you know, this hypothesis, as nice and as clean and as neat as it sounds, actually isn't the right track. It's something else about the spike protein that's changing that's enabling this virus to be more infectious. Mm -hmm. Any theories on that, that how the, the change in the spike protein leads to the increase in infectivity? Yeah, one, one thing that we've seen is that in the cells that produce the virus, because of course the virus infects human cells and then kind of hijack that, that particular cell to make it a factory to produce more and more virions that then go out and infect other cells. So in those uh, producer cells, one thing that we noticed is that the, the spike protein actually has certain sites um, on the protein, uh, on the spike, that are kind of pre-cut. You can think of it as like sometimes when you get a package in the mail, it already has like kind of a prefabricated cutout line that makes it easy to tear open. So spike has some sites that are kind of like that, that make it easier for a spike to attach onto a target cell and infect that cell. And we think there's a difference in that kind of uh, perforation, that pre-cutting process of the spike protein that's making it more and more infectious. But this is actually an area that we're still we're still working on. Okay, okay. Um, now, um, you mentioned that you've seen this in a lot of different types of cells all around the body. Um, how big was the increase in infectivity? What are we talking about here? Right, so we actually used a few different types of assays. So in the original work that we did, we used a very safe virus that we use in, in, in the lab, and we just decorated the virus or coated the virus with spike protein, either the, the um, original spike protein or the one carrying the mutation. And when we compare these two head to head and we've engineered this virus to actually deliver a little fluorescent protein so we can actually, the cells when they get infected, they light up green. So it's really easy for us to precisely quantify which human cells are being infected. So when we, um, when we initially did this uh, with, with, these, with either the, the regular or the mutation, uh, we found something between like a two and an eight fold difference. And that's, that's pretty big. You know, if you say that you have a eight fold greater chance uh, of getting infected, that's, that's a pretty um, serious change. Um, later, we actually were able to do pretty much the same experiment, except instead of using this, this other virus as kind of our um, main viral particle, we actually used the real deal SARS-CoV-2, which is the, um, the virus that causes COVID-19. And so, um, we came up with this little trick where we were able to make uh, SARS-CoV-2 particles that either have the regular spike or that have this, this spike that just carries this precise mutation. And again, test them head to head to see how well they infect cells. And of course here, they don't make cells light up green. These are, this is the real deal virus. So it actually causes the cells to rupture and, and die. Um, and here, when we did, we did this assay, we again saw an increase. It wasn't quite as high as, as what we saw with the, um, the pseudoviruses, not quite eightfold, but it was still quite a significant increase, let's say around two or threefold. And so um, either way, whether you, you just look at spike kind of in isolation, or if you look at it in its natural context with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, in both cases, what we see is this tiny mutation, just one letter change really increases uh, the infectiousness of the virus. Right, yeah. Eightfold is, uh, is quite, quite an increase. Um, now, this is not just a, a respiratory disease. It is another one of the implications here, uh, but one, one that involves multiple systems. Uh, what are the, uh, what's the knock-on implication for, for medicine? Uh, kind of knowing that this is, we're not just dealing with something that causes acute respiratory infection, uh, but something uh, uh, you know, of greater significance. Yeah, so we, we were surprised to, to see this and to, to hear this um, reported. You know, initially we did all of our work in a human lung cell line. So these are cells that are derived from human lung tissues. Uh, but we found that our results were really consistent whether we, in pretty much any human cell type we tried. So as I mentioned, we also looked at liver cells. We also looked at um, colon cells. And it looks like um, the virus is really able to infect um, any of these. And we were surprised that in some of the non-lung tissues, um, we didn't even have to boost levels of that ACE2 receptor. Some of them just naturally have high levels of ACE2, which is what spike binds to, to get into cells. And so I, I think you know, the emerging medical evidence is really that this is gonna be a multi-system, multi-organ uh, disease. Uh, in fact, one of the best early diagnostics that people who have had COVID-19 report is that they lose their sense of smell. This seems to be one of those, the earliest things. And we know that the human olfactory system um, uh, relies on, 
on neurons, olfactory neurons. And so what this is saying is that not only do is this virus able to infect, you know, whatever lungs, liver, um, kidneys, but also um, the nervous system. And of course, this is something that I think merits uh, further study. Of course, for most folks, they get their sense of smell back within, um, you know, weeks to, to, to months after they've had COVID. But, um, you know, it's very important for us to understand the long-term effects that can have on neurons. Neurons, unlike many other organs uh, in, in the body, don't really regenerate that much. Um, uh, so it's, uh, I, I think there's gonna be years of work that need to be done to, to us for us to fully understand the impacts of um, COVID. Sure, and as you pointed out to me, as we were talking right before this conversation, uh, Spike has a role in many of the vaccine development programs that are underway. How does this new understanding of the mutation uh, affect uh, the vaccine efforts? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So there is um, approximately 150 different uh, vaccine programs in different stages of clinical development, all the way from you know totally preclinical to phase three trials right now. And uh, many of the ones that are most advanced, of course, had the earliest head start. They started early. And as I mentioned, the spike mutation only came up in, in February of 2020. Uh, many of these, like for instance, uh, the mRNA vaccine um, from, from Moderna, they started their trials in, in January. And if the, uh, this mRNA vaccine uses a full length spike protein and it uses, of course, the version without uh, the mutation. Now there's reason to believe that um, because that particular vaccine, for instance, has encodes the full length spike, uh, it should be fine because even though there's just one, uh, this, this mutation just changes one piece of the protein, the rest of it can be used by our immune system to generate antibody-based protection or T-cell-based protection. Uh, but, you know, anytime you have a vaccine that doesn't perfectly align with the disease you're trying to treat, there's always a worry um, about how the, the mutation might impact immunity. And I think this is just something that needs to be tested. It'll very clearly be tested because as I mentioned, now here, sitting here in July, virtually all the coronavirus um, that's, that's currently um, active in the world carries this, um, this D614 gene mutation. So any patients being treated now um, almost certainly carry this, this mutation. The worry really is with some of the vaccines that have much, much smaller fragments of the spike protein. So some of them, whether they're DNA vaccines, RNA vaccines, or uh, protein-based vaccines, um, can carry maybe much, much smaller pieces, like little, little peptides of the spike protein. And so um, the worry here is if that, those smaller pieces maybe just overlap this portion that um, has undergone this, this mutation, that there might be less immunity than you would get uh, to, the, to the original virus. Beyond this particular mutation, I think this, this kind of the story serves as a little bit of a, um, a warning perhaps that we do have to be vigilant. This virus is just like any other organism on earth is capable of mutating and changing. And so one thing that I think is kind of a, a positive that comes out of this is we now have, um, with the efforts that have um, been put in to characterize the spike mutation, we kind of have a nice pipeline for any future mutations that come up to really very quickly try and understand how do they work, how do they change um, uh, infectiousness, and how do we try and figure out the mechanisms behind that. That's great, yeah. Okay, and so, um, you know, this uh, mutation, um, you know, we know that it increases the viral load um, and increases infectivity. What we don't quite know yet is, is the impact on, on deaths and, and mortality. Um, is that something, you know, that concerns you? I mean, obviously, it, not knowing it is, is a concern, but how, how much is that, is that a concern? And what are the other worrying aspects of this mutation? Yeah, so some of the um, other studies that have looked into this mutation have tried to analyze um, hospitalization rates or severity. And uh, the data we have so far is, is a bit sparse, um, but what we do have is there, there has been observed by one group at least, a higher incidence of ICU stays, which kind of uh, is, is a surrogate for more severe COVID um, with folks that have the D614 uh, gene mutation. And so that's, um, I should say that that trend, it, it was a trend, it's not statistically significant, but there was an enrichment with, with ICU stays. So right, right now, I don't think we have clear evidence that it increases um, severity of the disease, uh, but it might be the case that the disease is, is more transmissible, it just gets around to more people with the same severity, 
or it might be the case that it does result in a slight increase in severity. Certainly, if you think about it from the perspective of individual cells in the body, if the virus is able to transmit more effectively, you know, we often think of transmission between people, like, um, you know, you're giving me COVID or I'm giving you COVID, something like that. But, you know, our, within our bodies are communities of individual cells, right? And if they can transmit to each other more easily, that can also, um, that might also correlate with disease severity. But there's, there's no clear data about that right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, you know, the infection rate or the trans, um, uh, transmission rate, uh, in, at least in the New York area, I think is below one, uh, which they kind of uh, use as another surrogate marker for kind of the, uh, you know, whether we're a hotspot or not. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's good to see that that is kind of being kept at a minimum. Uh, but perhaps, you know, as we see this mutation making its rounds, you know, I, I hope we'll, we'll keep an eye on that number. Um, just to kind of finish off uh, the interview here uh, with you, Dr. Sanjana, um, you know, w will we find a way to eventually stem the coronavirus? You know, with, I guess that's a $64,000 question, but you know, where, where, do you, where do you see this going? Yeah, I, I certainly hope so. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I think everybody is, ha, has been shocked with really the effect of a global pandemic, unlike any that, you know, uh, anyone alive today has, has ever seen before. And, you know, my, my hope uh, is, of course, that the efforts, not just the efforts in my lab, but the efforts that really so many scientists around the world are making right now to try and contribute their knowledge, their abilities uh, to, to come together and work on this problem will result in some accelerated therapeutics, some accelerated diagnostics, and of course, an accelerated vaccine. And I think the best indications that we have by folks who are very plugged into uh, vaccine trials like those at um, NIH is that, you know, there's never been, you know, this kind of pace of development uh, in biomedical research period. And so I, you know, just based on that, I'm also quite optimistic that um, within six months uh, to a year, to, but to maybe to a year and a half, we will have a widely available, reliable vaccine and that um, will help end this pandemic. But, um, you know, I think there's a lot that, that we can learn from this experience and I hope that we're able to learn from it uh, because we have the tools today with things like rapid gene sequencing to really be more vigilant, to have better surveillance, to understand when something has uh, a pathogen emerges and to really um, mobilize resources uh, to that. And I, I think that those, those don't all have to be, you know, I'm talk, we're talking about things like sequencing and CRISPR. Those are very high tech things. They don't have to be so high tech. I think a lot of us have seen over the last few months how effective things like wearing a mask and uh, washing our hands are. Um, but I think having that science-based response that, that comes in and, and can critically inform us um, will be very important moving forward. And so. You know, um, it's probably not a unique thing to me, but I, I really do hope that we can um, prevent, you know, learn from this and prevent it not just in our lifetime, but hopefully for uh, future future folks for a long, long time. Absolutely, this is really a living lesson in pandemic preparedness, isn't it? Okay, well, um, and that's reason for hope uh, as well. So, well, I want to thank you, Dr. Stan Jenner, for joining us. This has been a, another fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for having me. Course. And I want to remind our audience uh, that you can join us virtually for live discussions on the future and networking on at the MMM Transform Conference. That's September 30th and October 1st. The link to register is in the description. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Take care. Yeah.